Diabetes affects over 125,000 children and teenagers in the United States. At some point in their career, teachers, school nurses, and support staff are likely to have a child with diabetes under their supervision. The purpose of this presentation is to provide basic but essential information about this condition which will allow school personnel to meet the individual needs of children with diabetes. Several federal laws protect children with diabetes, including the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Section 504 of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 1991, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. These laws make it illegal for schools to discriminate against a child with diabetes. Furthermore, these laws mandate individualized assessments of the child with diabetes. The required accommodations must be provided within the school setting with minimal disruption to the school and child's routine as possible, allowing for the student's full participation in all activities. There are two general types of diabetes, and both can be present in children. Type 1 diabetes, formerly called juvenile onset diabetes, or insulin-dependent diabetes, is due to an inability of the pancreas to produce insulin. Because the ability to produce insulin is lost, insulin therapy by injection is the only available medical treatment. However, since the early 1990s, there has been a dramatic rise in the number of children with type 2 diabetes. This form of diabetes may be managed by oral medications in addition to insulin. Most children with type 2 diabetes are overweight and have a condition called insulin resistance. Both types of diabetes are equally serious and require careful management. Still, most children with diabetes will be taking insulin as part of their daily routine. Insulin is a hormone that is necessary for most body tissues to absorb glucose, the primary sugar that the human body uses for energy. Diabetes is not contagious. Although there is no cure yet, it can be well managed by balancing insulin injections, food, and exercise. To achieve good control, blood sugar and urine ketone testing, plus the ability to interpret these results, are invaluable. Generally speaking, most children with type 1 diabetes are healthy. In fact, in many cases, they are healthier than other children their own age. The typical child with diabetes gets more regular medical care with an emphasis on prevention of health problems. Also, they tend to have a better understanding of proper nutrition and are more likely to participate in regular physical activity. The goals of treatment for any child with diabetes are normal growth and good health. The same is for any other child. The cognitive skills and action steps that school personnel should familiarize themselves with include recognition and rapid treatment of low blood sugar, recognition and basic treatment of high blood sugar, basic understanding of proper meal and snack needs and timing, the role of physical activity and exercise, supervision of blood sugar testing, understanding urine ketone testing, supervision of insulin administration, indications for use of glucagon, and academic behaviors offset by either hypo or hyperglycemia. Children with diabetes regularly must deal with two fairly common problems which teachers need to understand, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar, happens when the blood sugar level falls to abnormally low levels, either because of too much insulin, too little food, too much exercise, or a little of each. Children with low blood sugar sometimes behave erratically or may act unusually sleepy, drowsy, or confused. They may also be hungry or describe a feeling of shakiness, pallor, or sweating. The symptoms of low blood sugar can be very subtle and are quite variable from episode to episode. If your student is behaving in an uncharacteristic fashion, then always consider the possibility of low blood sugar and ask the child to perform a blood sugar test. It's not uncommon for the child to be unaware that their blood sugar is low. It's a good idea to meet with the parents and student to determine what symptoms are most common in their situation. Low blood sugar must be treated immediately by giving the child foods with simple sugars in them, such as glucose tablets, four ounces of fruit juice, or one-third of a regular, not diet, soda pop. Chocolate candy bars are not a good first choice. As a suggestion, Keep a fast-acting, easy-to-store sugar source such as glucose tablets in an accessible location such as a desk drawer or class closet. Ask the family or nurse to give you a fast-acting sugar source to keep in case of low blood sugar. 
If you feel that a child has low blood sugar, don't leave the child unattended because it's possible the child could lose consciousness. Never send a child of any age who you think may have low blood sugar to the nurse or clinic by themselves. Summon help. Severe low blood sugar can result in unconsciousness or seizure-like activity. Such events are relatively uncommon, but when they happen, call for help immediately. Subcutaneously injected glucagon can be administered by trained school personnel, which raises the blood sugar while emergency help is on the way. Glucose-containing gels can also be placed between the cheek and gums to raise the blood sugar level. However, as with any other person with altered consciousness, avoid inserting any solid objects into the mouth, including fingers, and keep the child turned to one side to prevent aspiration into the lungs in case of vomiting. Hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar, occurs when the blood sugar level is too high because of too little insulin or too much food. Children with high blood sugar levels may act tired, sleepy, or irritable, and often are thirsty and need to go to the bathroom a lot. High blood sugar is treated by giving extra insulin and sugar-free drinks such as water or diet soda. Children with diabetes must be given access to water and the bathroom when they feel the need. Prolonged high blood sugar due to lack of insulin can lead to a very serious condition called diabetic ketoacidosis, which can lead to coma and even death. Compared to low blood sugar complications, diabetic ketoacidosis occurs gradually. When blood sugar is very high, the student should have a urine test for the presence of ketones, an indicator that extra insulin may be needed. The student may have a fruity odor to the breath, suggesting the presence of ketones. The nurse will need to assist with this step. Some teachers think that students with diabetes sometimes pretend to feel low or high to get out of the classroom or get out of an activity they don't like. It's very unlikely, although this can sometimes happen. Most kids with diabetes do not want to be different or be treated differently. If you think this is a problem, speak with the student's parents or counselor but never deny the child's request for water, food, or a blood sugar test. Children may need to take a dose of insulin at school. The need for this varies from situation to situation. The school nurse may be asked to supervise this procedure, which can reduce the likelihood of dosing error. It is advisable to have information on hand from the family as to the amount of insulin to be taken in a given situation. Some children may use a pen device or a mechanical insulin pump to deliver their insulin. Try to familiarize yourself with these tools and how the student uses them. Children with diabetes may be required to test their blood sugar and take an insulin injection before lunch or a snack. Students who must take a scheduled insulin injection will need a little extra time to prepare and take their shot. Children with diabetes check their blood sugars several times a day, usually just before a meal. A blood sugar test involves pricking a finger with a lancet and placing a drop of blood on a special test strip or meter. Most meters and test strips analyze blood sugar levels in less than a minute. All sharps and test strips should be disposed of in a proper container. Doing a blood test is fairly simple, and most school-age kids do this themselves with adult supervision. Where the blood sugar testing is to be done will depend on the child's preference and the school district's policy. Regardless of where they check, the ability to test must be allowed and has been legally established by the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Disabilities Education Act. Make sure that you and your school staff are comfortable with arrangements made for blood sugar testing. For kids who check in the classroom, parents should provide a blood glucose meter, a lancing device with lancets, a sharps container for proper disposal of lancets, and emergency glucose for treatment of low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. Lancing devices should never be shared. Ideally, children with diabetes should be following a meal plan. Each meal plan is designed for the specific needs of the child and are based on age, gender, and anticipated level of physical activity. Eating on schedule is just as important as insulin in managing a child's diabetes properly. The focus of most meal plans is on maintaining consistency in the amount of carbohydrates eaten at each meal. These carbohydrate patterns are determined with the assistance of an experienced dietitian. The student may bring morning and afternoon snacks that consist of carbohydrates and protein, such as crackers with peanut butter. If a student with diabetes is required to eat a snack, but misses that snack, they're at increased risk for low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. 
In fact, skipped or delayed meals and snacks are the main cause of low blood sugar in children with diabetes. So, be aware of changes in the daily schedule and discuss these with the parent or nurse. Exercise is important for everyone. Diabetes does not prevent a student from participating in exercise or any physically oriented school activities. Physical education, like recess, requires planning for students with diabetes. Exercise, like insulin, acts to lower blood sugar levels, increasing the risk of hypoglycemia. Teachers on the playground should be aware of students with diabetes so they can provide help if needed. Children with diabetes often get an extra snack for strenuous exercise. A good rule of thumb is to eat a snack consisting of 15 grams of carbohydrates, or one carb choice, for every 30 minutes of intense exercise or play. The need and timing for the extra snack can be determined as part of the child's individualized care plan. If gym class or recess is immediately before lunch, for example, kids with diabetes should be allowed to eat a snack before joining in. Students should be allowed to carry emergency glucose to treat low blood sugar if they are outside and far away from the nurse's office or classroom. Glucose tablets are a good choice since they are not confused with candy. Many children will not eat glucose tablets. In these instances, four ounces of fruit juice is a good alternative. Athletics can be an important part of a child's school life. Many famous professional athletes did not let diabetes stand in their way from achieving greatness in their particular sports. Coaches are advised to note that diabetes is not a valid reason for non-participation or involvement in school sports or other organized physical activities. But coaches must be aware of precautions and planning required for strenuous exercise. An individualized diabetes care plan should be developed by the parent, the child's diabetes care team, and the school. Responsibilities of each party should be outlined. The areas that should be addressed in any plan include blood sugar testing, insulin administration, meals and snacks, symptoms of high and low blood sugar and their immediate management, testing for urine ketones and actions to take when these are abnormal, exercise, and field trips. Most primary school teachers will have closer daily contact with their students with diabetes compared to teachers in secondary schools, since students in the latter situation will be in contact with several teachers in the course of a typical school day. The secondary school teacher may be aware of the child with special medical needs, but may not become as aware of the subtle signs and symptoms which signal problems. Furthermore, there is a tendency for adolescents to conceal their diabetes from others for fear of being labeled as different. Also, many parents may find it difficult to meet with all their child's secondary school teachers. At a minimum, all secondary teachers need to be informed when a child with diabetes is in their classroom. Ideally, an awareness of the symptoms of high and low blood sugar is preferred. Extremes in blood sugar can be a common cause for irregular academic performance. Ultimately, the student is still responsible for his or her actions in the classroom, and diabetes should never be used as a shield or excuse. However, Improved blood sugar control is associated with improved academic and even athletic performance in most cases. Let's summarize now what many call the school bill of rights for students with diabetes. Children with diabetes require regular medical care to remain healthy. The need for medical care does not stop while the child is at school. Therefore, while at school, every student with diabetes must be allowed to perform blood sugar testing with supervision, treat low blood sugar with supervision, inject insulin when necessary under supervision, eat snacks when necessary regardless of location, eat meals at an appropriate time and have enough time to finish the meal, have free and unrestricted access to water and the bathroom, participate in PE and other school activities including field trips, Finally, over the past several years, there's been an alarming rise in the number of children diagnosed with adult-type diabetes, better known as type 2 diabetes. These children may or may not be on insulin therapy, but do need close adherence to a meal plan and opportunities to participate in regular physical activities. They are entitled to the same rights and considerations as children with diabetes on insulin therapy. For more information about diabetes in children, you can contact the following sources the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation,
American Diabetes Association, American Association of Diabetes Educators, Diabetes Exercise and Sports Association.